So, <laughs> love my mom, right? Lovely woman. She asked me, she was like, where are you going after this? And I was like, I'm going to Perry's. We're recording a podcast. She's like, I got this bag full of hamburger buns I'm never going to use. Would he want them? I'm like, no. <laughs> And she's like, just take them anyways. So I just pull up and I've just got like... A bag of buns. No, but like it's... Yeah, but I mean, it's it's, look at this. (laughs) Ta-da! to another episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast. I'm your host, Perry. I got Curtis and Swan with me this week. Guys, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. We're going We're going straight into it tonight. High octane. Something like that. High fuel. Here we go. Uh, starting right off the premiere. Sh- uh, no. No. Um, starting off the show as we always do with Flying Blind, where I blind our guests on something. They don't know what it is. Guys, what do you think about the nose on this one? I honestly don't mind it. I don't either. It's nothing crazy. No, it's kind of um, kind of uh, apple saucy. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of one note. I when, can see that. When I move my nose to the uh, to the top of the glass is where I really kind of find the um, the applesauce note in there. In turn, there's a little bit of sweetness. Side. Um, there's also some kind of cinnamonness on the nose as well. I keep hoping for like straight up apple pie, but it's definitely not that. It's it's certainly like the applesauce. That would be nice. That'd be a nice change of pace. It's like that cinnamon applesauce. Mm-hmm. That is a lot lighter than I thought it would be. Yeah. It's kinda like that on the palate too, honestly, with the cinnamon applesauce. But there's something kind of um there's a and I know this phrase is not correct, but there's a brown note to it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen like Red a, Busters. That didn't go well. <laughs> like a brown, like a caramelized brown sugar? Something like or... that. Like, I can't quite put my finger on it. Maybe it's a little bit chocolatey, but I taste it, and I'm, I'm getting the color brown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you we know, so... Now- Certain, We've now introduced colors. You know how certain people uh, hear music and they hear different colors? Or they see different colors when they they listen to music? You lost me, Chief. So, um, like, Kanye West does that. Yeah. Like, he'll listen to certain songs or certain notes or whatever, and he'll go, oh, that's like that sounds like purple. Or that sounds like orange. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. Never mind. Anyway, so it's not bad on the palate. <laughs> I'm it's, getting I'm, dead I'm getting stares from everybody. I'm getting a lot of the, the cinnamon... And uh, applesauce on the palate. More cinnamon now rather than the uh, uh, than the applesauce on the yeah on the nose. The more I drink it, the less I kind of like it. Not that it's bad, but like I think the initial flavor of it was the most interesting. And it's not that I'm finding anything more to it that's making me kind of change my opinion. It's just kind of flatlining as it goes along. Ginger. Thank you. That's what that's that what is. I was looking for. That I that kept saying cinnamon that is. on the palate, but it's it's ginger. Yeah, I agree. I can get behind that. I've, I tried that crystallized ginger you can get. Have you seen that stuff? Mm. It's like a almost like a gummy thing, but it's just crystallized ginger. It reminds me of that a lot. Okay. Now that you've kind of pegged the whole ginger thing, what are we drinking, Perry? Well, we are drinking something that we've actually had on the show before, but. Let's just say that never it, it didn't yet. Actually, you have. It didn't get recorded, though, because I didn't hit the record button. Really? Wyoming whiskey. Huh. Okay. Yeah. How, yeah. how old is this? Because I'm getting kind of a weird, conflicted thing on the palate for me. All it says is small batch bourbon whiskey. It doesn't say straight anywhere. Um, this was bottled on March 11th, 2016. See, it's strange. It's got like almost that sour wood kind of note to it that kind of leans me towards young but it doesn't have like i don't know it doesn't have that super green note that's off-putting from some of the new ones when we first had it we were all like oh this is awful it's grown on me a little bit i i think i enjoy it a little bit more now than i did 
than uh, 88 proof. So nothing super hot or super in your face. I don't know. I, I think that I would be interested to put this into a blind flight for somebody. Um, cause I have no idea how they might react to it. Um, blind. I mean, based just on what you guys have responded with, it's interesting. It's different. It's very unique. I would say. Yeah. It's a curveball for sure. Yeah. And I think it's something that's really kind of nice to test somebody's palate, not necessarily to be like, Hey, this might be something you like or anything yeah. like that. It just would help distinguish, Hey, if you're looking for, you know, like what's true what to what you know of bourbon, this isn't it. You're not going to have that kind of palate. So you're going to, it's just kind of differentiating. You're like, oh, I'm pick. I think it would help with like picking out different flavors and different, different notes. I think that's where I'm at. I can it. definitely see that. Well, do you guys want to pour something else as we talk about what we've been drinking recently? Yeah, we got half a liquor store in front of us. So no what kidding. Are you, what are you feeling? Man? I think that we start with something that is arguably bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since Arguably? you put it that way. Um, yeah, so this is the New Liberty Bloody Butcher Bourbon Whiskey, um, all the way up from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that my lovely wife, Lucy, brought back for me um, from a trip up to <laughs> up to Pennsylvania. And, um, well... Let's just try it. I'm just going to let you guys pour for yourself, because <laughs> I don't want to subject you to too much torture in this. But, uh, Do you- hey... Do you feel like the Bloody Butcher stuff's kind of a gimmick? I don't know because I haven't had enough to try and to um, really make an opinion on. Uh, just because, like, I mean, I, kn- I know that Jep the Creed has theirs out, but I haven't mm-hmm. had a chance to try it yet. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. But that's to be determined. Aged a whole nine months? Whole nine months, 95 proof. Oh, I saw the nine. I was like, nine years, man. Mm. They're putting some this time into awesome. this. This is awesome. I can't wait to try it. I I'm what do you venture to say that I'm gonna? I haven't even smelled it or or tasted it, but I'm gonna venture to say it's gonna be pretty feel pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think there's gonna be a lot of ethanol for some reason. We're just gonna find out together. But in the meantime, what have you guys been drinking recently? I've been getting into 1792. Hey. Hey. Hey-o. There yeah. we go. I had the 225th. I had the high rye, some more full proof, and the single barrel. Those are the ones that I have. Okay. Um, I got a picture sent to me of the 12 year that's coming out from yes. Perry. Yeah. And just preparing myself to get back into their profile, I I wanted to try more of their stuff. And trying all of them side, like side by side... They have some strange proofs. They really on do their stuff. Mm-hmm. They really do. And I can't tell if it's so specific because they're just like, this is gonna make it look like we really got nitpicky on what we thought was the best proof for it, or maybe that's just what was convenient for them. I have no idea. But most of their stuff is pretty solid. I like their single barrel that I have, and I had one of yours as well, and it was pretty good. I'm just, you know, vamping here, so I don't have to smell this. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> You're making a good choice there, Swan. Yeah, but it, honestly, all their stuff's great. Foolproof's still my favorite. Yeah. I think out of all the ones I've had, Foolproof is definitely my favorite. I'm super excited about that 12-year, though. Oh, I can't wait for it, man. I just, I'm, I'm so ready for it to get here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because I, I've seen people talk about how they found it already. <laughs> um, but when I ask store reps about it, they're like, man, we haven't even seen a press release yet. I'm like, hmm. how does that work? Anyway, saying it, Perry. I know it's not it, Swan. I'm sorry. It's like it's butterscotch, butterscotch, and like orange Lysol cleaner. Oh, specific. You know when they come out with really, really strange flavored Twinkies? Yeah. It smells like that. Yeah. I'm not expecting you guys to take a whole lot of time with it's this like one. A, it's like a, if it's. It has the smell of like a flavored whiskey. It also oh, it really a, does. It also has a very particular smell to like Virginia Black, which is Drake's, Drake's whiskey? whiskey. I was gonna say, huh? Maybe Drake's whiskey is really young. It is. 
<laughs> I would assume. I think it was like two years or something. You know what it is? Yep, this it's tastes... flavored. It's flavored moonshine. It's like yeah. orange, orange flavored moonshine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all. This is how I I uh, describe Virginia Black as well. Yeah, it's like stale cigarettes. Huh. I could see that. It's like eating black and milds. Ooh. Yeah. Specific. Ooh. It's, it's not like good, an ashtray. Man. I poured this for my dad, and he goes, I don't know if I can finish this. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to kill it so that I can get it away from me. Uh, but in the meantime, Curtis, what have you been drinking? Uh, funny that Swan said 1792, because I've been having 1792. Just the small batch, though. Ah, look at this. There you go. So I need to try on the small the batch train. again. Yeah, I mean, it's, the standard offering is really good. I remember when I first started drinking, that was one of the ones I picked up. Because, let's face it, it looks fancy and their packaging's pretty yeah. great. Um, and I remember picking it up and even at the time thinking, this is surprisingly light. Mm-hmm. But I'm guessing there's some nuance in there that when I first started drinking, I just couldn't pick up. Yeah. Um, because I just remember thinking, like, I want some burn to mine. And I had moved to the 100 proof range pretty quickly. And I think it's like 92-ish, 93, something like that. It's like 93 or something. I I think it's ninety two actually. It is because seventeen ninety two I think. Oh well, there you go. I think that they makes specifically sense. did that. Yeah, and I, it's just kind of light. Yeah, but I didn't have a problem with the profile at all. Mm-hmm. I will say that's probably one of the missing links that I wish it had a little more of. Was more of the barrel influence, and I think that's where you get the full proof. I think that's why the full proof is so nice. I honestly was not too impressed with the bottle and the bond just a standard release Mm -hmm. and it was actually kind of hard to find that bottle when it came out and now they do pics of it yeah and i've heard some of the pics are really good but just the standard release was not that great i had the good fortune to hang out with some some cool people over the weekend uh first and foremost of course you got to hear on last week's episode dixon deadman over at the bowman inn um kentucky owl guy had a lot of fun trying some different stuff with him. It was way better than this uh, this whiskey that we just drank. Um, that Swan is <laughs> having a very vigorous reaction to. It is not good. <laughs> Visceral is the word I was looking for, not vigorous. Um, it is jarring, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. It definitely is. I, that day also was National Bourbon Day. So, mm-hmm. of course, I went to OBC that night and had some bourbon. Curtis, why didn't I tell you I was going to OBC? I don't know what happens. I hate myself <laughs> for that. Hey, you want to go to OBC next week? Next week? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> anyway, so I, I did a little uh, little single barrel flight there as well, which was really nice. And then the next day, I got to hang out with Kyle from Bourbon Blind over on YouTube. It was a really fun night. He came over. Uh, he, he actually brought me this uh, George Dickel bottle and bond that's on the table and this Nika whiskey from the barrel, uh, which we'll get to both of those here in a little bit. But other than that, I actually have been drinking on a 1792 myself. No way. The high rye. Man, oh, we're all on it. <laughs> what a weird... Yeah. <laughs> all prepping, weird I guess. train that we're on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But one of the one of the cool things that I've gotten to try recently too uh, is the newest Booker's release, the Shiny Barrel Batch. Mm. Mm. Can I try that before I leave? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's around here somewhere. <laughs> Have you been able to find it anywhere else? I found it at Total Wine, and I found it at Costco. Okay. And actually, no, I think I found it at Kroger yeah. recently too. I definitely recommend getting it at Kroger. It was like sixty six ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, it's about that at Costco as well. Yeah. So it's, it's what I love about Booker's. You can just find it. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty consistent too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Plus it's like you can just find random releases. Like I just popped into one literally down the street from your house, two thousand seventeen dash three. Yeah. Yeah. Front porch batch? Yeah. Yeah. It's nuts. Great batch. I might have to go grab that from them. Anyway, that's what I've been drinking recently. Let's get into the episode, shall we? We're doing something very different this week. We're drinking nothing but bourbons and whiskeys from outside of Kentucky. 
which people have always kind of uh, said, hey, you should totally do this. And we've said, yeah, we will at some point. Um, and I think it's the same people who want us to try scotch more than anything. I've got some scotches on the bar, little samples of scotches, um, which we might I might pull one or two out as well just because, you know. Share the pain. Well, <laughs> I actually enjoy scotch a little bit. Yeah, see, Curtis likes it. Um, these scotches were sent to me by Matt from Whiskey Crusaders. I do appreciate that. I've seen that he kind of looks at the profile that people like and sends stuff that he feels like will be an easy entry into scotch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's exactly what he did, is he sent me bottles, well, sample bottles of stuff that he thought that I would appreciate or, at the very least, kind of enjoy. So, (laughs) yeah, I'll I'll pull one or two of those samples down as well. But uh, Swan brought a couple bottles Curtis brought a bottle that we're going to review later. Swan, do you want to try one of yours? Which one do you want to do? Do you want MGP rebranded, or do you want something a little different? MGP rebranded it is. He's making a face, guys. <laughs> well, here's the thing. The other I thing think... that you brought was um, Hudson Baby Bourbon, and I don't like it. Um... That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want us to, like, suffer through this entire yeah. tasting, I mean, you know? So a lot of these are going to be considered craft, and I, I'm perfectly cool with that. The only reason I bring Hudson to a lot of these is because they were kind of the people that pioneered a lot of this stuff, at least for the New York area. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's important to kind of give a nod to them that they've they've kind of created in some, you know, legislation and stuff to make it easier to distill in New York and probably other places because of it. Um, so I, good for them. Uh, doesn't really mean that we have to like their bourbon, I guess, no. but, um, no. I'll tell you one thing that I wish that we could have done, and maybe this is something that we'll do for a future episode too, is, uh, comparing the different styles of rye whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like the, the New England style, I think it's New England, and, um, then like Canadian rye whiskey and Pennsylvania rye whiskey is a big one too. Yeah. I think Maryland has a very specific type as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I think we should do some kind of episode like that in the future. We talked about bringing Iverson back to do Can another he just Rye like episode. Be my spirit guide through Rye. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. Just spirits in general. The guy knows his stuff. Oh, so much though. He could be your spirit guide. He loves the Rye though. Spirits guide. I like that. <laughs> Got him. Um, yeah, I think that there is, and I, we unfortunately. May not have picked the best offerings for this, but there's such a stigma around bourbon that if it's not made in Kentucky, and Kentucky makes up to 95% of the world's bourbon, it's just not good. And that's true. I hate I hate to be an elitist, but you know I prefer most of the bur I, I prefer bourbon that comes out of Kentucky nine times out of ten more than I do what is produced outside of. Kentucky, with mm-hmm. the exception being like MGP and uh, you know a couple of Tennessee products, but you know I've not had a great experience necessarily with outside of Kentucky bourbon products. Yeah, but there's definitely some that stick out. Like I mean, we've been a huge fan of the Bell Mead stuff. Oh yeah, we've been a huge fan of the Boone County stuff, and that's outside of Kentucky, right? No, that's uh, MG. That's well, that's MGP. So yeah, it is. Yeah. So yeah. I mean. That, and obviously, a lot of the stuff that MGP does, they do some great stuff. I know that the Whiskey Vault guys do that Eleanor release, and a lot of people really like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's there's there's stuff being produced outside of Kentucky, maybe even aged in Kentucky. And just for people who are just kind of listening or just getting into, what is MGP? So, MGP is the distillery in um, Indiana, right? Mm-hmm. They're basically a contract distiller. They will build mash bills and and build certain flavor profiles for uh, upstart companies, upstart bourbon distilleries, upstart distilleries in general, kind of in the same way that Bardstown Bourbon Company is doing right now. And it's interesting that we bring up this point, too. From what I understand, Bardstown Bourbon Company is actually going to be taking over the production of Bell Mead Hmm. here soon. Okay. So you heard it here first. Uh, (laughs) that that being said though they get kind of a bad rap at times because they are kind of like 
I would say almost the Walmart of bourbons or the mass producers of, of bourbons. Yeah. I, but I don't, I don't know if I've honestly ever had anything bad from MGP. No, I haven't either. Now, I know they did just put out their own release, which is one of That's their true. first. And I've not seen great stuff on that, but it doesn't seem like they're holding the best to their own product for themselves, which is cool in a way because yeah, they're I mean, sending off... it's not off, their business, <laughs> yeah. really. So, I mean, they're, they're definitely sending off some of their better stuff to clients, which is exactly what I think everyone wants. Sure. So... Well, I, I think to that point, too... Again, not to harp on them too much, but Bardstown Bourbon Company is coming out with a couple of products. Well, really one product that has some of their own distillate in it, Mm -hmm. indicating that, you know, yeah, they are trying to move towards being their own brand while still being a contract distiller, still being a blending operation as well. And I think that as long as these kinds of companies can maintain that aspect of their business, I don't see any problem with it. No, and some people really mesh together their own distillate and MGP product super well. I mean, there's some people that literally blend the products together like Bardstown Bourbon Company, or there's people that do what New Riff did, and they had OKI, which was a brand before, and it was literally just, hey, this is our brand until we can get our feet off the ground with our own product. What was it? Distilled in Indiana, so MGP. It was barreled in kentucky and then bottled in ohio i think it was loved in ohio is what it was oh okay. yeah it's uh, something like that but yeah it was still i mean so uh, it was finished in ohio i think knows. there was something to do with it where it was finished in ohio yeah but i mean people loved it i mean sure. it goes for crazy amounts of money they did different finishings of it and it was decent product and it was well aged i mean they had an 8 10 and 12 year that they consistently put out yeah I don't mind this. By the by, the way, I don't think we ever established we're drinking Widow Jane. Yeah, this is I don't the, mind this at all. No, I don't either. And this is um, a Widow Jane ten year. I think the only complaint I've had about this brand is they claim that their stuff comes out of the creek next to the distillery and it's brought in product. But um, just the transparency there, if you're going to, you know, pull from MGP or a large distillate like that, it'd be nice just to have the transparency. If we're just talking about the juice itself, it's pretty good. It's not bad at all. No. It's pretty good. I thought it was younger than 10 years, though. Yeah, I, I would say I so, too. I'm not getting some of the more mature notes that you would get with a 10-year, like a you know Rebel Yell 10-year or something like that. Like, you're not getting some of those. Henry McKenna 10. Yeah, Henry yeah. McKenna 10. Like, you're not getting some of those deep, rich flavors of chocolate or, or uh, barrel influence or anything like that. Swan, the proof is in the low 90s, right? It is 91, yeah. Oh, wow. That is interesting to me because... Drinks higher. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that I think about Boone County. Boone County at 10 years was basically about the same proof. Mm -hmm. I thought that it had a lot more character to it than this does. It does, yeah. And the 12-year, yeah, it may be two more years old, but it still is around the same proof. I think it's like 91.4, 90, something like 91.3 or something like that. They do a 12 year of this as well. And I've uh-huh. had it before. There's not, I'm going to be honest, there's not a major improvement from the 10 That's really interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, do they, do they age these in New York? I believe so. Yeah. I mean, they put on their thing right here that it's uh, from Rosendale, New York. So, yeah, but from can mean so many different things. Yes. I would venture to say that they probably get the, the white dog shipped to them Mm -hmm. and that they actually age it up there in New York, which if that's the case, I think that's probably a good indication of why the flavor profile tends to skew a little bit young. Whereas a 10 year Boone County or 12 year Boone County has more depth and more more of a, a profile to it, just kind of in general, um, because it is actually sitting through the Kentucky seasons. Yeah, and that's a huge thing when you get outside of Kentucky is yeah. what's the climate like. I mean, you look at uh, Texas bourbon that they put out. Oh, yeah. Some of them, it's like, oh, this is a two-year-old, and you're looking at it like, that is darker than George C. Stagg. <laughs> yeah. What went on? 
And then I guess this one being from New York, it's 10 years old and we're, you know, kind of looking at it like, eh, it's more like four to five to us. I mean, it's, yeah. it's younger tasting for sure. So, I mean, just having the Kentucky seasons is maybe we're just in the sweet spot and that's why people like it from here. I don't know, but I'm really excited about this. Yeah, this, uh, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to try this. This is something again that I got from Kyle from, uh, bourbon blind. He basically said, I didn't like this. Here you go. <laughs> Which was awfully nice of him. Um, and I've been saying for a while that I really wanted to try it just simply based on its accolades. I mean, anything that's named Whiskey of the Year, I'd like to kind of not necessarily put through the ringer, but at least experience to some degree. So let's go for it. Kurt, go ahead and pour you some. I love the simplicity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the packaging is really strong on this one. It reminds me, have you ever seen the Kings County bottles? I think so. Looks kind of like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like almost like a personal flask. Yeah. Definitely has more of a, a scotch. Not even scotch. I mean, it's just more of a, you know, Japanese whiskey, which obviously makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Having had it just once, I agree with you, but I'm I'm interested to go back and revisit this a little bit here. Uh, by the way, uh, this is 102.8 proof. Yes. Also, I don't read Japanese, so <laughs> I cannot tell you much more information about this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it says age or anything on it. but So this one's really not from Kentucky. To... This one's really not from Kentucky. No, definitely not. I mean, I'm definitely getting more of that peatiness on the nose and more of like kind of that moss kind of uh, feel. Here, let me see that bottle real quick. Sure. He's using that Google Translate app? I'm going to try it. <laughs> Curious if Google has any more information. I actually really like it. It's kind of butterscotch like... Even just butter heavy. I think this might be the favorite nose I've had of anything. I would tried agree tonight. Um, I, I I definitely get some of the more earthy, peaty notes on the nose. Okay, the front just says uh, Nico Whiskey Co. Limited um, five four thirty one. I don't know what that is. Uh, Minami Aoyama. I'm butchering all You nailed this. that one. Tokyo. Oh, okay. Um, so nothing about an age on it. Well, let me see what's on the back. It's English. Oh. <laughs> so nothing about the age on it. No, nah, not a bit. No. I think a lot of the barrel influence is coming through on the nose, though. It drinks like honey. Like, it has that consistency of honey. And actually kind of tastes like it, too. But in a way that it's been diluted by something else like it almost drinks like a cocktail or like a hot toddy or something like that where it it adds to the consistency of what you're drinking but it doesn't necessarily overpower it i'm definitely getting the viscosity of it like being that thick um with more of that sweet honey taste um but i'm getting actually quite a bit of it's what i would imagine you know when i'm drinking japanese whiskey it tastes like, but it's kicked up a notch being from the barrel. I'm getting a really weird note. I just want to see if anyone else is getting it. Because I've actually not had Japanese whiskey before. Honey barbecue? Yeah. Uh-huh. I can see that. It's kind of strange. Okay. I'm not... I, I like it. It's just different. I don't know. Yeah, there is a savory note on there. Oh, there's definitely a savory note. Like... Mm. I want to I want to say like honey barbecue chips because that's what a lot of people think. No, it's definitely not that. It's literally like honey barbecue smoked meat almost. Yeah, I really like enjoy this nose. I uh, th- this I really is, enjoy this just all around. It's really growing on me, and I like it being the one one hundred two proof uh, from the barrel because usually when you try like a Japanese whiskey, usually it's sitting about that like. 90 to 94 proof if i am uh correct on that anyway i might not be but um 
that extra kick kind of gives me that uh that's what i kind of wanted yeah they um at least from my knowledge of it they don't do a whole lot of cast strength stuff no really anywhere outside of kentucky that's more more of a you know u.s kentucky thing I mean, I know there's some, like I know Redbreast does a cast strength, but even then it's not getting anywhere near the 130 to 140 range no. some of the cast strengths no. here do. It's like 105 cast strength, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not going to hurt you. Well, that, that, I mean, that all has to do with barrel injury proof and, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. But this is good. This is pretty darn good. good I thing. don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, our, our bourbon of last year was... I, I C918 from Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. Mm-hmm. Yours was... Mine was the uh, George C. Stag. That's right, yeah. Up against those? Not sure that I would I would put this ahead of them. Well, no, but it's also completely different a little bit as well. If I had to compare this to anything, it's literally just kind of like the Bellmead cask. Just with a more savory note added to it. Which I can... I don't know. I mean, I think I'd still prefer the Bell Mead. Mm. Yeah, I would too. I mm-hmm. think I would lean more towards this. I would put Just it in that wheelhouse, though. because of the, savory, the yeah. savory note that I want. Um, out of let's say one out of ten, like one out of ten of our top bourbons, would you put it in top ten in terms of last year, or you know, I think I'd put it like an eight or seven. I think out of everything I tried last year, this would be up there, but I don't know if I'd put it in my top 10. Yeah, I might put it in my top 15. Okay. Um, it, it's, thinking back to everything that was released last year, I I think it's fantastic. I think it's a, a great pour. But I, I stand pretty firmly upon what I, you know, what I had last year as my top 10. Yeah. <sighs> I only made like a top five, so. Yeah. You also got to realize that some of those lists about like top bourbon of the year are so subjective and odd. Like I know, what was it? Jim Murray did one a few years ago where it was uh, Crown Royal Rye <laughs> Whiskey of the Year. Yeah, that's true. I and mean, I think the next year he turned around and named uh, WLW as his Whiskey of the Year. Yeah, which I mean, it could <laughs> just be that strange turn. You know, somebody tried it and they're just like, "Oh, this is dumb. I'm never gonna like it." And they tried it and they're like. This is the best thing I've ever had. Yeah. This is fantastic. Yeah. But at some it's very point based off of like emotion a lot. Yeah. But at some point you gotta look at him like Crown Royal Man. <laughs> <laughs> really? Come on. I almost poured uh, I, uh, pulled some Crown Royal out. I've got the bourbon mash at home. Oh, do you really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why didn't anyone bring in the uh, Canadian mist? Ah, uh, <laughs> dang it. Well, okay. Curtis, if you want to go behind the bar, I've got just a standard offering of Crown Royal back there. Hard pass. All right. Good call. Hard pass. <laughs> Man, I, I really enjoy this, though. This is... I would say this is one of the bigger surprises from whiskey that I've had recently. Not in, like, I, I saw the, you know, the, the accolades that it, it got, and I went, no, it's stupid. It's not, you know, it's not going to be good enough. But I see so much versatility in this. I think this would be... Great in cocktails. I would love to smoke a cigar with this. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a great cigar whiskey. It's just, there's there's so much for me to love about it. And honestly, I feel like this would be a really good stepping stone between bourbon drinkers and peated whiskey drinkers. This is like the second peat of whiskey i've had and i like this way better than what i had as soon as you guys were like i'm smelling peat i'm like oh god it's yeah. coming again <laughs> see but the, i think that's what it's a it's a notch above like it, it kicks it up a little bit yeah compared to the standard offerings of the, like peated whiskeys yeah i mean last time i was like i'm gonna be ron swanson i'm gonna have log of in 16 and all it did was bring <laughs> the log like the iodine and pain like i was not about it yeah and then with this it's it's pretty solid it seems like it's got a lot to offer whether you're a bourbon drinker or a scotch drinker so I, the versatility like perry was pointing out it's definitely yeah. there i also think that's like the culture that we've also been accustomed to too because like we're more accustomed to the bourbon and the like kind of 
Kentucky hug, the bolder flavors, the spice. Whereas like over in Japan and you know all that, it's more of that pe- and uh, like Europe, Ireland. Um, you're getting more of like that peatiness. It's a little lighter. Yeah, you're not getting the uh, the bold flavors that were what bourbons usually attested to. Well, I I say that we try something else that's not bourbon. I figured we should go with a scotch just so we can get this a little bit out of our systems and then move on. This is, I know I'm going to say it wrong, the Tomatin? Tomatin? I don't know. Uh, It's called Dual Char. It's aged in bourbon casks and virgin oak. It's a 43%, so 86 proof. I will also let you guys pour this at your discretion. See, it scares me because it's in a sample bottle, but the sample bottle is blue. (laughs) And it looks real light. It looks really light. Swan was very hesitant with his pour there. I'm terrified. Don't be terrified. It can't be that bad. If I drink this and I'm like, Perry... Stop with this. Just start pouring me Redneck Riviera. <laughs> like, I'm going to be concerned. I you know, hope you don't do that. <laughs> this is light, but just looking at it, it's really strange to me. I know this has got to be aged a good amount because it is so oily. Like It's almost oilier than some of the Elijah Craig barrel proofs that we've had. The way it sits on the side of the glass. Oh, the legs are incredible. Yeah. I wonder how old this actually is. Smells like scotch. Smells like scotch. Smells like scotch. See, but that's something I'd like to get it more into. Just kind of understand it a little more. I I totally agree. I think that we should do kind of a deep dive into scotch just to understand it. Because, I mean, honestly, there is no bourbon without scotch. There is no bourbon without Irish whiskey. You know, it, it's all the it, a, a process that builds upon itself and, and history and all that. Yeah, Part of me because there's to, definitely connections between the two, oh, you there, know, absolutely. in spirit making. Yeah. Part of me wants to agree with you, and the other part's looking at this, and it's like this just looks like painful water. <laughs> like I just <laughs> painful water. Yeah, it's, it's the Ron no, Swanson story. There's no color to it, hardly at all. Is it the peatiness? Is it like the? I think the the problem the, is is like when I pick up a bourbon and I'm like, oh, it's 130 proof. I'm like, I'm gonna get some burn off of this, and I'm expecting that. And with this stuff, it's like this looks like new make that's been aged for like two months and then put in there and then i taste it and i'm like whoa okay it's a hundred it was like 90 proof or whatever this was and it it hurts and like it's different it's just i'm not expecting it here here we go i'm gonna at least try it i i kind of like this one honestly i i am not finding a whole lot where i'm being distracted by something that i don't like Mm -mm. honestly that's as Spawn doesn't like it. Nope, not for me. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> as as far as scotches go for me, I think this is one of the more approachable ones and, and something that I can... I, I don't know if I could drink this regularly like I do bourbon, but I think that it could be something in my repertoire. Mm-hmm. Repertoire. I just don't think there's as much variance. In and scotch? that might just be me, me being naive and not knowing. Um, you know, like me just starting off on bourbon or something. Um, but I feel like ver- the variance on bourbon, there's so many different notes and flavors and profiles. And like, like you got a whole wheel and a lot of the, the scotches I've had, that they're all in the same kind of slice or kind of vicinity. You know what's funny is that you you say that, but it's kind of, there there is a school of thought that believes that bourbon is one of the, Narrower the, the, spirits. The least complex spirits out hmm. there. Okay. I think that it's... I think that bourbon is more approachable. And I think that's where that that idea kind of comes from. But I don't think that it's less complex or less interesting than some other whiskeys. I, I mean, of course, I would... 
heck, it's this is my bourbon podcast, not this is my scotch podcast. But like, yeah. I, I would drink, I would drink bourbon all day, every day, over the world's best scotch. Well, yeah, you know. Yeah. But and we we've, we've talked about this before. Would you want to replace bourbon with scotch or an Irish whiskey? Like, if if push came to shove, eventually, and all the bourbon in the world disappeared. I don't know if I would. I would rather have this Nika, you know. Oh, me too. Yeah. Over the Scotch. Yeah, I agree. I think it depends on what part of the flavor wheel. If you're looking at like the bourbon flavor wheel, you like. If you sure. look at the savory kind of meaty qualities of some of the bourbons, and that's what you lean towards, Scotch is in your wheelhouse. It's out. It's close to that. If you look at somebody like me, <laughs> who's still t- struggling to who's, get this one down. Yeah, I'm still struggling. Uh, if you look at somebody like me that tends to lean towards Elijah Craig and some of the Heaven Hill products that tend to lean towards like sweeter, you know, baked goods kind of thing, you don't seem like you get that as much in scotch. Yeah. Scotch is more of like savory heavy. Yeah. But I also definitely think there's an inability for me to pick up on notes in scotch because the initial hard hitting notes are so different. I just have an inability to pick up a nuance. And maybe that's like kind of what i was going for i that's surprising to me i didn't know that bourbon was like considered the lower tier spirits yeah well i guess not lower tier but like saying that it's not like very complex well you kind of have to think about the process about it too like for us it's got to be at least 51 percent corn it's got to be you know aged a certain amount to be called straight bourbon whiskey and that's kind of what people strive for and, you know, you've got all these classifications, even like bottled and bond gets it even more restrictive. And then you look at like just even the, I'm going to butcher it, Tomatin, what, what was it that, that one was called? That's, yeah, it, I don't know the exact pronunciation, but Yeah, yes. but I mean, that was, you know, what was the description on that? It was aged. Uh, it's dual chaos, aged in bourbon casks and virgin oak Yeah, barrels. so they can do some wild stuff to get their product to taste however they want. Well, okay, I can understand that. But the fact that, like, bourbon has these restrictions and we still have these you know, kind of multiple wild different notes. I don't know how anyone could say it's like... I Yeah, and I, I have a hard time agreeing with it as well. Like, the more that I have taken the time to understand and get just enveloped in bourbon and bourbon culture, I, I tend to dis- disagree with that notion a little bit more. The other thing, too, is that it takes scotch... Anywhere from two to three to four times as long to achieve some of the flavor notes that we get on a four, five, eight, 12 year old bourbon. Mm-hmm. You know, part of that has to do with the fact that we're using new charred oak barrels and Scotch is using used barrels to achieve their flavor profile. I just think that there is something to really be said about the flavors that come out of that, we'll call it virgin oak, as opposed to something that has already been used. I I just, I think that bourbon in terms of complexity seems to kind of blow scotch out of the water. That's just maybe a controversial opinion. <laughs> and as yeah. the words were coming out of my yeah. mouth, I realized that, oh, that could be people controversial. People aren't going to like that. Um, well, do you guys want to make our way back to the States? Please, yes. yes. Okay. <sighs> do we want to hit New York again? Or do we want to come back a little bit closer to home? I'd like to come back a little closer to home. All right. Well, that would mean, in this case, Kirkland Signature. Oh, that's real close to home. Premium small batch bourbon. It's Tennessee straight bourbon whiskey. This is uh, Dickel Juice, so I figured that this would be a good thing to do right before we tried the George Dickel Bottle and Bond. Okay. You know what I also also would have been a good kind of uh, whiskey we could have tried? What's that? The uh, Uncle Nearest. Ah, dang it. Maybe we should just have another one of these. I think we should. I, there, yeah, I, th- I think we need more than an episode to kind of cover some of the... All right, so this is part one. Part two is uh, to be determined in the future. 
Because a lot of these bottles, for me personally, were just impulse buys. Like, I like the branding on that, or you know, I've heard some people talk about this, whether it be good or bad, and I just want to experience it for myself. And it doesn't always yield the best product. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, like I said, it's a uh, Tennessee straight bourbon whiskey. Comes from the George Dickel Distillery. I got this, of course, at the Costco liquor store. I believe that this was about thirty to thirty-five dollars. I cannot remember off the top of my head, but yeah, hundred and three proof. I mean, if you're just looking at the sides of the glass, you can tell it's seven years. Just based on the legs? Yeah, just just, based on like how oily it is and the legs and stuff. Oh, yeah. The nose is pretty consistent. Nose is really not bad. It's kind of peanut buttery. Yeah. I want to be surprised by this so much so that I'm like, this is a a valid bourbon, but like this brand does not take themselves too seriously. (laughs) I mean, all of their stuff is branded to kind of look like almost an off brand but i don't know so far i'm kind of i'm kind of impressed and i, I don't know if i'm impressed because i really like it or i'm just impressed because you didn't have any expectations i had zero expectations i I'm think i'm pretty that, impressed with it yeah the nose has kind of got an apple crisp note to it as well you remember those like apple chips mm-hmm. uh that's kind of what i'm getting okay I'm getting that peanut butter a lot, but then when you have it on the palate, you get this burst of flavor that really is Mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm bourbon. Here I am. This is not bad. This is not bad. This has opened up a lot since the first time I had it. The first time that I had it, it tasted like pickles. I mean, just straight up pickles. And I was like, this is... huh." I didn't get pickles at all. It must have opened up quite a bit. It's opened up so much. This, I, If you had blinded me with this, I would not have even been able to tell you that this was Kirkland Signature bourbon. I always get the same thing from Dickel. Just an overwhelming black pepper note on the palate. Oh, I can, st- I can definitely see that. Yeah. A lot of people get Flintstone vitamins, too. I could see that. Kind of I, that like grittiness that yeah. you get. Not necessarily the gummies, but like the chewable, chalky ones. Yeah, it's the chew- it, It's the chalky ones that, yeah. that people talk about. That pepper is specifically what I'm getting now that you yeah. said it. And I, I get it on a lot of the Dickel products. Like I tried the James T. Kirk that they put out. The oh, yeah. Same thing, <laughs> man. I'm sorry. Yeah, pff, me too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's definitely, that's one of the few bottles I'll tell you, buy and don't open. Because it's just, it looks really cool. And if you're a Star Trek fan, it's just something to have on the shelf and, and look, you know. I, I would buy that bottle solely if I had the opportunity to meet William Shatner. <laughs> Honestly, so that I could get him to sign it. Could you imagine if you just checked out and then the second you rang it up, William Shatner popped up on the register just pow. Well, he's in... Like the Dr. Pepper commercial? Yeah, sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that black pepper is seriously there. I get it on anything Dickel I've tried. And it's like, despite the proof, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's very prominent. Yeah, it always comes up. I haven't had uh, Dickel products that much, so... Well, you're definitely going to have one here very shortly. As far as Dickel products go, I would say this might be my favorite, which doesn't give you guys a lot of hope for what we're about to what we're about to drink, but I don't know. It's good. I think that it's you know, there aren't a whole lot of age stated bourbons out there anymore. This is again 7 years at 103 proof in a liter and for like 35 bucks, that's really not that bad. I do have no. a question about Dickel and I'm a little confused. They're one of the people that do Lincoln County, right? Uh, as far as I remember, yes, but I think that it's, it might just be for their own product. So, I don't know if they necessarily do it, like say you're sourcing from them. Yeah, that's my question. I don't know for sure. So like the Kirkland stuff, that may not be Lincoln County? Yeah, I, I'm going to err on the side of no. Okay. But who's to say? I have no idea, because I, I just attribute that peppery taste to the Lincoln County process. I don't know. I mean, I get the same kind of almost peppery thing when they do the mesquite finishing or uh, whatever it is to the long branch. Which I guess with the mesquite, like you would 
anticipate some of those flavors, yeah. but I don't know. But I'm not well versed in you know Dickel products, so I'm not entirely sure. Well, I think it's time for you to try another Dickel product, then, well, Curtis. Let's go for it. This is George Dickel Bottled and Bond. This is a 13 year old whiskey. That's exciting to hear. I uh huh. Um, but you just said that the other one, the Kirkland, was your favorite out of all Dickel products. So interesting. Yeah. So this is actually not classified as a bourbon. This is classified as a whiskey. Yeah. Okay. Um. It is super high corn. I think it's like 84% corn. Well, you can smell it on the nose. Yeah. It's I'm pr- all corn. It's like I, popcorn. I'm pretty sure that it's 84% corn, 5%. Am I at a movie theater? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's It really smells like buttered popcorn. Yeah, you are not kidding. This, to me, I'm just taking a guess here. It strikes me as somebody saying like, Ooh, that ain't it. Let's come back next year. And then they did that for 13 years, and like, it's time to put it out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. So what'd you say the the mash bill was? I'm pretty sure that it's 84% corn, 5% malted barley, and that leaves, what, 11% rye? So a super high, high corn. corn percentage. I mean, it explains the nose. Yeah, no, it definitely does, but I... I'm curious what makes this a whiskey as opposed to a bourbon. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know exactly what it is that maybe it's the filtering process. Maybe, you know, I, I, I just don't know, but it, it just intrigues me. I'd like to learn more about why this is a whiskey and not a bourbon. Yeah. That would be interesting to know. I also, it this smells just, so young. It's just very unique. It smells so young for the, it being 13 years old. Is this the only bottled and bond whiskey? Mm, uh, no. Mellow corn. Okay, yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. I And I can't I can't think of any. I know that there's something else that's bottled and bond, but I can't think of it off the there's top of my head. There's not many of them, though. It's, no, the it's point. mostly bourbons or rice. Yeah. Just for comparison, what other whiskeys are like that high in corn i honestly could not tell you of any i'm just interested in on maybe that's why it's so so corn. i think the forward. highest the highest corn percentage i've seen is like 74 or 76 maybe 78 yeah. but i th- that is the absolute highest 84 is bananas high yeah and i think that's why it changes the entire profile i know that heaven hill a lot of people think is a high Higher corn mash bill, but I mean, there's no is... way that it's 84%. Though. No, 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 it's not. But I mean, it's just this is blowing it out of the water if you're just looking for corn. I mean, this is, reminds me of the mellow corn. Mm hmm. I just feel it's... like I'm having buttered popcorn at the movie theaters. It tastes like it too. There's a distinct, like, butteriness. Yeah. I've had this a couple times since I, I cracked it open with Kyle, uh, again from Bourbon Blind, who brought it up for me. It's grown on me the more that I've had it. I do not see myself, though, putting this in my top 10 bourbons from 2018. Or 2019, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, no. <laughs> or whiskeys, rather. Yeah. I, like, I, I can't. I like the palate a lot more than I like the nose. I do, too. I, I do mean, too. substantially. Me too. I mean, I was making fun of it just from the nose, but no, the palate's decent. This would be great for somebody who just loves sweetness or just loves a, a yeah. savory note like buttered popcorn. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that this has a place for somebody. This is just not for me. If I was watching a movie and this <laughs> there was you offered go. instead of popcorn, there you I go. might be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give yeah, me a triple. I think, it's a, <laughs> I think it's a very interesting whiskey, and I really kind of, I'm not off-putted by it, like off, off-putted, off-put by it. It's really, there's something nice about it. There's something I enjoy about it. It's that buttered popcorn kind of savory note, but it's very specific that I would only want to have it really with like a movie. I, I feel like this is one that I, I actually do enjoy. It. I do like it, but yeah. I, this is going to be one that I definitely have to be in a specific mood for, which yes. is fine. I have plenty of those at home now, and some of them are even from big distilleries like uh, Buffalo Trace, even. I mean, 
but this is a very specific mood, like you pointed out. Like, all right, I'm going to watch Endgame. Hopefully, the guy at the movie theater is cool and he's bringing in a handle of, you know, yeah. <laughs> bottled and bond dickle. <laughs> Got my T.W. Samuels under one arm. <laughs> yeah. I definitely couldn't put it in any, like, 2019 top 10, though. <sighs> that, yeah, and I asked that. I probably said that prematurely. Because, I mean, who's to say what else is going to come out this year? Yeah. Maybe the rest of the stuff that comes out this year is just pure crap. But Maybe honestly, it's just straight like, up garbage. Even prior to, even what I've had of this year, I don't know if I can I, I mean, don't get me wrong. If if I had to choose between the two, Four Roses Small Batch Select and this, I would like put Four Roses Small Batch Select at each of the top 10 spots, <laughs> like one through 10, yeah. before I gave one of those spots to this. Yeah. That being said... This is not bad. No, it's I good. just know that there are better things that have come out this year or that will come out this year that will beat this yeah. significantly, substantially. This is just very unique. If our top 10 is based off of uniqueness, then yeah, maybe it's it in would, there. <laughs> yeah, maybe it There's a lot of bourbons that I don't like the nose or maybe the nose isn't that great. I take a sip of it and I go back and I'm like, I like the nose better now after having the palate. This is not one of those at all. No, the nose is still bad, <laughs> but <laughs> it's the reverse for me for sure. I like doing this. This is fun. I, I as as much as it kind of puts us in a spot where we may be talking a little bit negatively about distilleries outside of Kentucky. I think this gives us the opportunity to kind of broaden our palate, broaden our minds, and try something that we may not independently want to experience. You know, I think that in this kind of controlled setting where we sit down and we go, all right, we're going to try stuff that is out of our wheelhouse. I think that's kind of important. I think it's a good thing to every now and then step back and understand what we're doing in order to understand what we like and to kind of get a grasp on why we like the certain things that we do. And while, you know, maybe a couple of the things that we've had tonight have been bad, quote unquote bad, um, it, they've been kind of outweighed by some of the, some of the better pours too. So, I'm, I, I've enjoyed this. I'm looking forward to doing this again, I would yeah, say. I mean, out of all of them that we've had, I would say the, was it the Bloody Butcher? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. I'd say that's the only one that I would say is quote unquote bad. I think the other ones were just like something that I might not go for, but it's good to know about this, these kind of flavors and those Oh, notes. for sure. For sure. And, uh, and, Get out of the wheelhouse of, hey, this is Kentucky bourbon, you know? Yeah, yeah and I, I also think it's important to mention that, and I'm not going to toss any names around here, but there's there's a lot of craft distilleries in Kentucky, and there's only about two or three of them we really, really talk about as liking, and I've had a lot of the product from the other ones, and I'm not a huge fan. So, I mean, you get outside of Kentucky, it's bound to be the same thing. I mean, if you have two or three good craft distilleries per state, we just may not have it on the table. I mean, you look at Tennessee, we, we both, we all love Bell Mead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, you look at, um, like, Pennsylvania, and I think Dad's Hat Rise, like, the thing that comes out of there. I mean, there's just specific things that people like out of each one. I mean, if you come here, I'm definitely going to tell you, pick up New Riff, pick up Wilderness Trail. Yeah. Those are the ones that I, I tend to tell people to gravitate towards when they come here. Like, I just had a guy at the liquor store the other day. He was down here, and he's like, what can I only get in Kentucky? And I was like, JTS Brown, JW Dan. He's like, no, 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 none of that stuff. Like, fancy craft distillery stuff from Kentucky. And he had never heard of Wilderness Trail. What a shame. Yeah. And I was just like, well, get this. Try it for sure. That's so funny because I was at, when I was at Total Wine earlier, um, I was talking to this guy and he was like, I just went to a bourbon tasting last night and I had Wilderness Trail. And he was like, I had to go get it. And I was like, yeah, man. Like, And he said, and I, I also had New Riff as well, but Wilderness Trail was what I'm really, really going for. And I was like, 
you got it. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, I was you're, like, not you're not wrong. wrong. And uh, he was asking me, he was like, so, like, what else would you, you know, recommend? And I said, I said the uh, the Samuels. And, um, and he was, he kind of looked at it and was like, hmm, really? <laughs> Just kind of gave that, like, yeah. kind of, you know. Like, not sure about this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you got to give it a try. <laughs> it is so hard. That guy was like, what can I only get in Kentucky? And there was a whole handle of T.W. Samuels on, on the bottom shelf. And I'm like, I'm grinning, and I'm just handing him this plastic, like, crappy-looking fifth. Yeah. And he's looking at it like, ha, 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 okay, see you later, kid. <laughs> yeah. they're, like, they're like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Are like, you crazy? No, I do. I do. <laughs> like, right, let's just see. have it just just try it man yeah. Yeah. yeah and then i i mentioned henry mckenna and you know kind of yeah more of those those kind of bottles and you know got on board on those yeah um but mm. yeah so we, we're definitely going to come back to this topic sometime in the future but we are moving on to our review of oregon spirit american straight bourbon whiskey Aged four years. Aged four years. Uh, Swan, remind me, what is the proof on this? All right, let's see. I think it's like 94. 94. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read some stuff off the bottle because I feel like it's pertinent. Distilled from grain. You know, that's great. Yes. Right. Classic. Cool. They really put that on the front of the bottle. Um, perfect blend of corn, wheat, malted barley and rye so it's a four grain Ooh, okay a four grain at four years old mm -hmm. not a lot of four grain products at that age continue uh that's about it they really go into detail about where they get the water and stuff which is not out of the norm a lot of people do that so i i took a peek at the label as i was pouring it as we were kind of wrapping up our topic saw that this area of the country gets 300 days of sun. Hmm. Yeah. 300 days. So if that's the case, and I mean like this is assuming that they don't have, you know, cloudy days or they don't have rainy days or, or whatever, that sun is influencing the barrel a little bit more and influencing the climate a little bit more. And I, I feel like, you know, the assumption would be that because it's getting more direct sunlight, it's pulling the barrel or pulling the bourbon rather into and out of the barrel a little bit more. So maybe at four years, you know, it could potentially drink like an older whiskey, but there's also the chance that it could not. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I'll, I'll tell you on the nose. It reminds me a little bit of the Bloody Butcher, kinda. By the, the way, I want to I want to I want to say this is not a Jeff the Creed Bloody Butcher. This is the um, the New Liberty Bloody Butcher Bourbon Whiskey. Yeah, totally different. This is that's from Pennsylvania. Yeah, but I will have to say though, I honestly think that it's. It's not the bloody butcher note showing up, even though it kind of reminds me of it. It's I think it's youth. honestly the malted barley. barley. Dude, that's exactly what oh, I was okay. going to say. Yeah. Interesting. It, I mean, so do you remember the cherry wood smoked barley where it just punches oh, you in the face with yeah. like malted barley? Oh. I'm, I'm getting, getting a lot of that barley yeah. influence. Huh. Maybe Oregon is like the market for cherry wood smoked barley. <laughs> like they sent it up to there. Is, yeah. People were just going nuts over it. It's definitely the barley nose. I'm, I mean, I'm really interested on what the palate's going to taste like. Yeah. Cause the barley nose is definitely there. Yeah. And the, wait, and I was kind of comparing wait. it. Wait, this is Oregon spirit. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> this is the second whiskey that we have reviewed. That's from Oregon. What? <laughs> In a row, nonetheless. Break out the corn chips. Let's get crazy. No. Redneck Riviera. Oh. It's from Oregon. Is an Oregon whiskey. Man, we are... Interesting. I hope I like this better. I think I... I think I do. No, I definitely like the nose I mean, better. I, yeah, I mean, I haven't had the palate or anything, 
But compared to the Bloody Butcher, the new Liberty uh, Bloody Butcher, this one has more of a complexity. It's more barley influenced. Perry has a inquisitive <laughs> look. This is like the malted barley and the rye are fighting for first place, and yeah. neither is winning. Oh. And and while the mm, while the corn and the wheat are there, they're kind of like sitting in the stands watching, and they're a little bit drunk, and they're going, hey! <laughs> "Yeah!" <laughs> they're cheering them on, like they're they're not they're a part of the team, <laughs> but not in the way that like is actually contributing to the overall flavor profile. I like it this better. This is weird. I like it better. This has got a target audience, and it is not me. I think, I think that's a good way to put it. I wouldn't say that I dislike it, but I don't know if I'm on the side of like favoring it. I don't think I. I, I don't dislike it, but if I had to give it our rating system, it's going to seem like I don't like it. I know that somebody's going to pick this up and take a sip of it and think very highly of it. It's a thing. And it, it's just not me. If you like cherry wood smoked barley or just malted barley anything, this is this is something for you. Because it's going to add some of that rye spice that maybe you haven't been you know accustomed to before. Yeah. I don't... I think if you want that, that barley kind of dark chocolate kind of bitter kind of note, that's for you. Yeah, I think it's the this bitterness that's the most off-putting. Yeah. Because it is definitely a dark chocolate, like a bitter dark chocolate note. And I mean, I, again, I don't mind it, but it's so out of the realm of bourbon mm-hmm. that, and I'm I'm trying not to be biased. I'm trying to to judge it based on you know, whether it's good or not to me, you know, I would say that it is marginal at best, which is, may sound negative, but I think that there are plenty of products out there that are far worse than this is far, far worse than this For is. For sure. I would take this any day over Redneck Riviera. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's, there's even products in Kentucky that I would take this over. Like, yeah, like what? Ah, uh, I don't want to call names. Okay, I'm not. I'm not gonna do after, that after the after we stop recording. I'll do it. But gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's definitely some products that I would I would take. You know, I would I would take this over some of the products that Kentucky puts out. Uh, I I do like that they put the four years in there. I like that. Um, the fact that they got a little ambitious and did a four grain that's cool because not a whole lot of people are doing that. Mm-hmm. It's just not my profile. I think the finish is okay. I don't think it's really standing out to me necessarily. Um, I can still kind of pick up on some of the corny flavors. Uh, There's definitely a little bit of a savoriness to it towards the end as well. But I just think that overall the finish is a little bit flat. I'm not really getting a Kentucky hug or, or anything of that nature. I'm getting more of a finish that I'm getting from like a Japanese whiskey or or a scotch. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think it does have a little bit more overall body to it mm-hmm. than uh, some of the other stuff that we've we've tried tonight. This does give me a scotch feel, which is weird because I don't usually have the perspective, I guess, to say that. But after having what we had, I could definitely see it. It's almost like it's... Uh, it's drinking like that. It's earthy. Yeah. It's definitely earthy. Yeah. And I, I, I for sure see what you're saying when when you talk about some of those scotch notes. Yeah, I, I I'm not. I don't have. I don't know enough about scotch to compare it. But scotch well, seems yeah, like it's either. mostly barley, from what I can tell. Again, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, and it's just it, it's got those notes to it, which there's certain distillers now too that are taking a lot of, you know. Let's look at one here in Kentucky, the Alltech guys that are doing 
all the stuff with um, Town Branch. Town Branch. Yeah. Again, not our profile, but they tend to lean towards this kind of flavor profile where they're doing core, more of like a, I guess they label it as a single malt type stuff, and he's yeah. got influence from Scotland, and that's kind of how he likes to distill. They're doing well, the same thing. Let, let me say, too, I did just have the Town Branch Malt, uh, the, the Town Branch Malt Whiskey mm-hmm. yesterday. This is way better than that. Good. Good on them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, a seven year, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. This is four. They're doing some good stuff. Yeah. I think making it a four grain, but having that malt whiskey in the forefront was probably a good choice for them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Kurt, what did you buy this for? I bought it at, it was $36, 39 with tax. I don't think that's unreasonable. Honestly, and and I'm I'm thinking about the the process that went into making this whiskey. So not only is it um, age stated, it's a semi hefty proof, but it's it's a four grain product. So the distiller themselves has to actually go a little bit deeper into the production side of it. Yeah, and they have done some cool things, at least from what the side of the bottle reads, where they've said they've gone in and carefully selected what grains they want. So somebody has gone in and said, I want specifically this strain of corn. I want specifically this, yeah. which is cool. I love that they put in the craftsmanship. There's and a lot of people local, that do that. Local to Oregon, I believe, is what they that it said. I think I saw that on there, too. Yeah. 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 So 36 before tax. It's not that bad. Hmm. You know, I mean, if if it still existed, which it doesn't, Heaven Hill six year bottle and bond, you know, I'd buy three of these way before I bought one of these. Sure. Or three of those, excuse me, rather than one of one of these. But it it you know, we're at a point in bourbon consumer culture where this is just a little bit more of the norm. So I don't consider that price to be r- really unreasonable. Yeah, I think that it's in the realm of understandable. And geographically, what what certain regions are looking for. Yeah, I think this. I mean, may I don't know. I've not, I haven't been to Oregon before, but maybe this is what you know that region is looking for. Yeah. Keep Portland weird, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and review this product, uh, the Oregon Spirit. We have a review system of nose, palate, finish, and price. Each category is out of five, and then we total the score for out of 20. I'm going to go first. Okay. I'm going I'm to go ahead and set the stage. I was not a huge fan of the nose. I'm going to give it a 1.5. I don't think that it is bringing enough to the table to make me excited about what's going to be on the palate. And at the same time, I don't necessarily like what's on the nose. I think it's kind of got a bitter, sour note to it that's a little bit off-putting. I could see that. I think that's probably the malted barley still... Really playing a big, yeah, yeah, big point in it. I think a big thing is getting your mindset off of this is going to smell like bourbon and this is going to be my standard bourbon, and like having that be the foundation. If you have the foundation of it being barley, I is, think it totally kind of switches. I it. understand what you're saying, but it doesn't say it doesn't say malt whiskey. Yeah. It says straight bourbon whiskey. So that's true. <laughs> I, you, you know, I mean, like I, I would anticipate a bourbon nose or a bourbon flavor profile. And this just does not deliver. The nose does not deliver for me. So I gave it a 1.5. Yeah. I'll go. Um, I think I'm going to give it a, a two and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two and a half just because. My mindset's, I think, just like a little more in the 
the barley sense and thinking about the different geographical regions and like maybe this is what's actually considered bourbon or whiskey in Oregon's region. Sure. So I think I'll give it a two and a half. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that's like something crazy. It's not like yeah. I'm giving it a, a four or something like that. Um, it's just very barley heavy. And I it's definitely, not what you expected, it, but yeah. it's okay. It's not, like, yeah, it's yeah. not what I expected. I can it's, see that. It's okay. Um, it's not as off putting to me. I think overall, like, it is leaving something like I want to have more of those bourbon notes, but just trying to keep my, my headspace in that kind yeah. of direction. That's fair. I think I'm going to give it a two. I mean, that's, it's fair. I think I'm right in between you guys. I do like that. It kind of supports your theory, by the way, about bourbon being so versatile as far as like yeah. where the flavor profiles are. But yeah, it's, I'd, I'd probably be with you on a 1.5, but I, I think, honestly, this is going to be somebody's profile. It's just not mine. Um, that malted barley is strong. I mean, oh, I'm really... It's super strong. I'm really surprised it doesn't say, you know, malted barley on the front in giant text. I think it has to be just the geographic, like the geographic location of it. I will say they've... They've done something different because I've tried the Woodford malt whiskey. I like this better. Yeah, I do too. So they've they've really narrowed in on a specific area of bourbon that has been kind of missing, and they've filled in on it. That's good, but it's not necessarily an area I was looking to fill. You know? Yeah. yeah. I and to to that point, I I just took another sip of it to make sure that my my palate score was on point and I I'm gonna stick with it. I gave it a two point five on the palette. Um what's that bring me up to a four so far? I, I think that it's it's one of the more unique flavor profiles that I've ever had. But again, if we're talking about just bourbon, it doesn't quite deliver on what I would consider a bourbon to be. There is a really really interesting like barbecue cedar note that I did not pick up until this this most recent sip that I really really love. I think it's absolutely delicious. Yeah. And that is what kind of carries into the finish as well. I'll get to the finish here in a second, but again the the, the palate for me was a 2.5. For the palate, palate for me is a 3. Um okay. I thought it was better than the nose. It has that more of a savory quality of like a smoked meat. Oh, it definitely does. Very, I mean, it's very rich. It's very, very rich of this like crispy, you know, like that crispy piece of the meat that you get, you know, whether that being on like a pulled pork or something like that. I think that's like, it's kind of that burnt crispiness. Mm, yeah, I see that. And that for me, I enjoy um, so I think it's a little better than, than the nose on that front. So I'll give it a three. I gave it a two. Honestly, I thought it just carried everything from the nose directly to the palate. Okay. I didn't really see a whole lot more. I do kind of see what you guys were talking about as far as like the barbecue, but it's not necessarily the meat portion for me. It's almost like when you stick your head over a smoker and you inhale a little too much. Like you get the, you get the <laughs> I wood see chips. That. No, okay. I definitely yeah. see that. Yeah. And you get almost kind of a mesquite wood chip or like an apple wood yeah. wood chip mixture. And I don't know. It, it's not bad. Again, it's just not my profile. I'm going to say that a lot. Cause I know there's somebody out here that's going to, you know, try this and think this is it. I mean, like this is going to open some new doors for them. But for me, it's not, it's really not that, that great. I, I, I think that this has, you know, based on what we're saying, this has a good place in pairing with barbecue. Just, just period. Yeah. Um, I could definitely see that. I, the finish is not my favorite. Um, it, it carries a little bit of the notes that I'm not a fan of, but 
it does still kind of extend into the the some of the savory notes of the barbecue flavors. I'm going to have to give it a two, though. I I just think that it's... It's just not quite hanging on to what I, I, I think is the most enjoyable part of the palate. Um, doesn't really expand any way in, you know, what what the flavor profile is delivering. There's virtually no Kentucky hug. I just think that it's kind of a bland finish, so I'm going to stick with the two there. Yeah, I'm totally on board with that. I'm giving it a 1.5. Wow. That's my the lowest of what I, I've given, just because it just stops short, and it doesn't... For me, it didn't carry on any of those, those notes that I had on the palate. Um, and it just kind of... I don't know. There's something about it that's kind of... It, it's too bitter. It's too much of that dark, yeah, dark chocolate. Like, yep, I see that. It's like on the palate. I'm like, okay, we're on a good mesh of these kind of flavors, of these dark flavors. And then at the, at the finish, I'm going, oh, a little too much. <laughs> like, a little too much. You, you kept, you kept the smoked meats on for a, a little too long. And so I, I think get it's, that. That's my. That's the least favorite of my of my review on it. So 1.5. Shockingly, I'm going to completely disagree with you guys. I gave it a two and a half. I thought it was the best wow. out of all of it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And I, I think part this of it, is really divisive for yeah, us. I think for me, I really like like dark, dark chocolate, like 72, 80% dark chocolate. And it gets a little bit of that through the nose and the palate, but the finish is where that really shows up and it seems like it's a little off putting for you guys, but I think that's my favorite part. Granted, two and a half is not that much different from your score. <laughs> yeah. But for me it's still, you know, the trend for you guys has been, you know, up, up, down. For me it's definitely the highlight so far of it. It's not necessarily one of those finishes where you're just like, oh, it's got like the honey drip down your throat. It's got that savory continuing, the building heat, all of that. No Kentucky hug, but just as far as like the flavor turning into something else, I def- I, I like it uh, a little bit better than the palate. Hmm. Well, that just leaves the price. I give the price a 2.5. So that leaves me with a final score of 8.5 out of 20. I personally cannot say that I recommend this. But I understand that there is... There's a market, there's a time and a place for this one. I don't know. My my, my final score is an 8.5. Yeah, I think a 2.5 makes sense. For me personally, like you were saying, it's just something I, my profile can't get totally behind and probably something I would probably go and buy, you know, like a T.W. Samuels or, or something of that matter um, before I went and got this just because my profile is totally different. And... And so, yeah, two and a half. Like, I don't think it's a bad price for what you, for what we're getting. It's just total. It's just off my profile. So I feel like there has to be somebody out there that's like, ah, oh, this is what I want. Yeah. But for me, it's just not. I it. think so too. Um. So for that, I have a uh, nine and a half overall score. I actually gave it a three. Uh, wow. Yeah. So my reasoning behind this. I am going to take a little bit of this, Perry. Um, uh, wait until you smell it. So I, I wanted to cap off th- th- cap off this episode because, you know, it's it's Kentucky bourbon. We, we have to drink at some point Kentucky bourbon. And yeah. I figured we'll just open up this uh, 2008 you looked Turkey at me 101. Like, what are you doing? Return to form. I was a little goodness. surprised that you wanted to, to have a nip of this here. Kurt, but it, especially considering Swan was like, I don't know, like I don't think so. But 
I gave it a three. My reasoning behind it was, is I'm thinking, what can I compare this to? And the two that I'm comparing it to are the Woodford Malt Whiskey. Yes, I and, totally agree yeah. with that. And I'm comparing it to the Cherry Wood Smoked Barley. And if I'm looking at the price of those two from Woodford compared to the price of this and preferring it over it, I, I think a three is justifiable for I what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, I like the age statement. I like the fact that they made it a four grain, but it is definitely a malt whiskey in disguise. Yes. Uh, it still brings me up to a 9.5. So, I mean, it's not wildly... It's not something I would tell you to go pick up unless you were like, listen, I've been to Total Wine 15 times. I have every single thing in there. What do I need to get craft-wise? I think what's interesting for us to kind of take away from this review, too, is that we we did take the time to deliberate on this product. It wasn't like we all smelled it and went, no, nah, there's no, I hate this. I can't drink this. You know, we, we spent time with it. We dissected it. We understood why, you know, we, we didn't like it necessarily, but I, <laughs> Swan's real happy about the one one that is in his glass right now, but yeah, we, we're all kind of in the same, same ballpark. I mean, you know, if we had to average, it'd be a nine out of 20. Um, we had the same score so. ish nine ish out of 20 mm-hmm. around that. Um, you know, it, I, I couldn't say again that I recommend this, but I think that it has its place. I think that people could enjoy this in certain, certain circumstances rather, uh, whether it's around the bonfire or barbecue or, or whatever, but as as far as you know what i would consider my understanding of bourbon or my profile when it comes to bourbon it's just not in my wheelhouse so yeah yeah that's all that can be said about that that does it for the review let's move on to everybody's favorite segment tips and bits i'll start man I got I got two today. Okay, great. One's not enough for a full tips and bits, but uh, so J Cole's been putting out some new music with okay Dreamville. Down bad, it's fantastic. I've been listening to it in the car on repeat. Um, second one, and I know I'm like three years behind on this. Making a murderer on Netflix. Finally got around <laughs> to watching it. It's great. I I just can't stop. <laughs> yeah. So I if you haven't seen that already. And you've been passing it up. It's definitely worth going to watch. For mine, I'm going to say season six of House of Cards. Really? I ju- so, I never- so this is the first one without Kevin Spacey, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. Well, it's the last one. First and, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's the first and the last one without Kevin Spacey. It's with only uh, Robin Wright. I believe right. her name is. Yes. Um, and man... So I was, stuff. I was, yeah, I was a loyal fan from season one. Started watching it season one, went all the way through, and then the Kevin Spacey thing happened, and I was like, "Well, I'm done with House of Cards." But, but, <laughs> but, then, literally just this week, I started watching the last season with Robin Wright. Man. It's good stuff. I because good and the hear. reason I yeah, and the reason I stopped was I was like, it's not the same show. They're gonna rush to conclusions. They're gonna try to get to sure. the end too quickly. Sure. As of right now, I'm not completely done with it, but it's a pretty rocking season. So That's awesome. I'm hoping it continues all the way till the end. But uh even if you have if you haven't watched any House of Cards, that series is one of my favorite series. So last week, Curtis and I had the opportunity to go up to Bullet and uh, check out the uh, what was it the the world class bartending finals. Yeah. Um, by Diageo. By yeah. By the way, the the lady who was in the first round when we when we were there. Yeah. She won. Oh, cool. Yeah. So on the on the way back. Um, well, she goes to Scotland now. Yeah. 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 Uh, on the way back, I was like, hey, 
Curtis, have you listened to the uh, the new Anderson Pack album? Yeah, and you said yes, but kind of no. And like, I'm gonna. I I think I might have recommended this before, but I'm gonna double down on it. Ventura is so far the best album that's come out in 2019. Um, and make it better, which is the second track on the record, is one of the best songs. I think I might have ever heard in my entire life. What song? Make it better. It's hey. the the second track on that album. I, it's strong claim there. Perry. I I know. A lot of I music. know. Yeah, that's but, a lot. But I'm. It, it, I I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna step down. This is the hill that I'm gonna die on. <laughs> okay. One song. All but right. so I, I I also have this. Um, this isn't really a tip and bit. This is something I forgot to talk about earlier in the episode. It it could very well be a tip or a bit, um, just in terms of educating yourself on the world of bourbon. So I, I took an, a, a lift out to the summit, um, which is where I met up with Kyle from Bourbon Blind and Chad and Sarah were out there too from It's Bourbon Night, of course. And just get to talking with my Lyft driver and, um, what do you do for a living? You know, you know, what, what do you enjoy? And I was like, Oh, I do a bourbon podcast. I was like, well, last night I drove a guy out to a liquor store. I get there and he goes, all right, I'm going to go in. I'm going to buy me this $300 bottle of bourbon. He goes, what, what, what are you talking about? My driver goes, now I can't remember what the name of it was, but it was old, old, uh, old, old poppy, uh, old poppy Van Wrinkle. Huh. Oh, <laughs> it was one of the best moments of my entire <laughs> life to hear this guy who had no idea what he was talking about go, old poppy Van Wrinkle. <laughs> That's amazing. I had one of those moments too this week. Oh, did you really? It was bad. Yeah. I walked in and I just assume anyone that ever sells liquor, when you go in and you're like, do you have any Weller? They look at you like, nah, maybe next week, here's a truck day, whatever. I walked into just just random Walgreens out in the middle of nowhere and they had a pretty decent selection. So I look at the lady that's right next to the liquor. I was like, do you get any Weller? And she's like, honey, I don't know what that is. And I'm just like, <laughs> like Weller bourbon. She's like, nope never heard of it and i'm like <laughs> you're right <laughs> and for some reason it suspicions just, confirmed it just yeah. didn't just didn't register i was just like you know like the one people always ask about she's like just looking at me like honey stop <laughs> yeah. no it ain't happening i don't <laughs> want you to be here that's anymore. what <laughs> go away that's when you're like yes keep it that way let me know whenever you hear weller <laughs> Well, this has been a really fun episode. I've, I've uh, enjoyed doing something different. Maybe we'll... Well, I, I, not maybe. We'll definitely have to do this again in the future. Part two. Yeah, for sure. Curtis and Swan, if people want to follow up with you after this episode on social media, where can they do that? On Instagram, you can find me at KurtCon, and on Twitter, Kurt underscore Con 15. I'm on Instagram at MyBourbonFinder. If you would like to follow up with me personally, I am at PRitter1492 on all social media channels. If you would like to follow up with the show, it's at my bourbon pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Give us a five-star rate and review on iTunes. That really does help us find new listeners and get new people, even just seeing the show. That is super important. If you have not already become a subscriber on YouTube, that's youtube.com slash this is my bourbon podcast every Thursday night. I do live streams, and uh, they're getting to be a lot of fun. I did a full week of live streams a couple weeks ago now at this point, which was taxing, I will say, uh, at the very, very least. You can find all of our apparel and merch at bourbonshop.threadless.com. We're going to be having a free shipping uh, promotion here very, very soon, so be on the lookout for that and then the big one at patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast is where you can become a patron of the show for as little as a dollar a month we are going to be 
reworking some of the Patreon tiers here very soon. So stay tuned for that. You are going to be getting exclusive content just based on your Patreon pledge. So stay tuned. We will update you about that as soon as possible. Looking forward to these guys being on next week. A little teaser, that's all I'm going to say. Um, thank you all so much for listening this week. It really does mean so much that you hang out with us every week. Um, I just want to say, like, middle of the day, today, I got really excited that I got to come and record another episode of the show. It just was like, all right, here we go. I'm ready for it. I'm excited. So I just can't wait for for what's to come, not just next week, but in the near future. We have some really exciting things that are about to happen with the podcast. Not going to get too much into it, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Again, thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week, but until then, I'm Perry. I'm Curtis. And I'm Swan. And this is my Bourbon Podcast. It's pretty good. <laughs> I have a great falsetto, man. Yeah, can we go? Can you do some more? The sweet, the sweet one. It's a sweet one. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna take you to the grocery store and just anytime someone buys Dr. Pepper, Perry, Perry, pop out. The sweet sliding down the checkout aisle. <laughs> It's the taste of the sweet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs>